It is uh, six oh one by my clock, so we'll jump in. Thank you for those of you that are uh, here and tuned in promptly. And um, my name is Ethan Hausman. I am a business outreach for CSWD, and I'm joined by my colleague, who I'll introduce herself. Hi, I'm Robin Orr. I work uh, for CSWD doing uh, community outreach and events outreach. And I'm tonight's wingman. Right on. And um, so I will be leading it through the presentation, um, but uh, Robin will be in the important role of fielding questions um, and relaying questions that we're going to answer live. And maybe you want to explain how that question will go, question asking sure. will go? Sure. So down at the bottom of your screen, you might have to wiggle your mouse a little bit to see it. There's a, a button that says Q&A, which is uh, questions and answers. So if you just open that up, you can you can type your questions in. I'll be um, reading those throughout the presentation and some I might answer to you in typing and others I might hold until um, we're at a question point so we can answer it live for everyone to hear. Um, one thing I would encourage you to do is when you have that open, if you look up at the top, you can see either open questions or answered questions. So if you, if you look at, at the answered questions, you'll be able to see if someone else has already um, perhaps asked the question you had in mind. So you won't need to um, focus on typing it in again. So I'd encourage you to just take a peek at that. But we'll have plenty of time for questions that various points during and at the end of the presentation too. Thanks, Robin. And without further ado, we'll jump in. Um, so um, go over quickly what, uh, what's on the agenda for today. Um, and I, are you seeing my screen, Robin? Yep, looks great. Good. Um, so we're gonna talk quickly about who we are, CSWD. Um, as well as the sort of broader context around why composting is all the talk these days and why it's important um, and about what's special about compost as a product. And then the sort of the core of the presentation is the six steps to backyard composting. And we have some demo videos that will reinforce what we go over. And we hope we'll get lots of questions and answers because really um, this is meant to be, you know, an introduction, but we always find people have their own questions and sometimes from some experience. So fine if you've never backyard composting, composted at all. Um, I know from a couple of questions that I've gotten um, in advance that we have people with some experience um, on board tonight and I'm happy to try to field questions from them as well. So we will be a range of experiences and maybe um, people who have some experience may have some insights to share with others as well. Uh, CSWD, Chittenden Solid Waste District. Um, we represent Chittenden County along uh, county lines, the residents and businesses here. And um, we are a public municipality. So we're board governed and have a volunteer from every town that we um, represent on our board of commissioners. Um, and being a municipality allows us to set solid waste management ordinance, which is basically like the local requirements for how you manage your waste. Um, we're all composting right now, um, or keeping our food scraps out of the trash, I should say, uh, whether that's through composting or other means, because of Act 148, which is uh, state law. You know, we're, that's now a state requirement. So um, we are part of uh, sort of the boots on the ground enforcing that, but we also, in some cases, go beyond state requirements um, with what we require um, here in Chittenden County. And um, you may be familiar with some of the facilities that, that we operate. Um, and own. Um, our drop-off centers are among the more public facing of our facilities because uh, folks that don't have their trash recycling picked up curbside may be bringing it to us at our drop-off centers. Um, and it's also the sort of um, hub of our special recycling programs, especially our Williston drop-off center. So things that can't go in the blue bin, but don't either can't or don't have to go in the trash. So batteries and scrap metal and natural wood um, got other examples for us, Robin? Um, fluorescent light bulbs, motor oil, um, leaves, yard waste. Awesome. Thanks. And then um, the environmental depots are hazardous waste facility. Um, so um, that is by appointment, but it's quite easy to get an appointment. And um, in general, there is no cost for residents to dispose of their hazardous waste there. It is behind the airport. 
And Green Mountain Compost is our organic facility. So that's where we're seeing a lot of action and a lot of food scraps these days, about 6,000 tons a year. Um, and it's going up as the, the law is, um, as people are uh, becoming aware of the law and, and doing what they need to do. Um, and then we have some exciting, uh, exciting changes happening there, expansion of Green Mountain Compost as well. It's also where we accept uh, larger loads of food scraps. And then our materials recovery facility, the MRF, MRF, is probably a facility that unless you've been on a tour, you may never have been to, but it's where we sort all your blue bin recycling. So it's where all that stuff comes, gets sorted by material and then sent out in bales to processors. And we always like to frame the why in just pointing out that we only have one landfill here in Vermont, one operational landfill. So there's only one place for our trash to go and it's 75 miles from the center of Chittenden County. And it, um, that, and with the amount that we send is not insignificant. So that is tractor trailer loads and multiple tractor trailer loads a day um, going to Coventry to deposit our trash. Um, and if this is an opportunity for you to guess how much material we each produce a day, if you take the total amount and divide it by our Chittenden County population. So I'll let you think about that. Um, it's not just what you're throwing in the trash. It's worth considering that that businesses and construction are producing other wastes. And so that's divided by on a per capita basis as well. Um, we, uh, here you see that, that this is what we actually sent to the landfill. And uh, this is an important slide for us because it, it sort of points to the opportunities we have to be sending a lot less material. The black 53%, and this is 2019 data, but the black percentage is the stuff that was unavoidably trash and, and properly sent to the landfill. But that means that 47%, uh, close to half, was divertible material. Could have been kept out either by recycling it and sending it to the MRF. That's the blue bin recycling portion. We talked about what's for the special recyclables, um, like batteries and scrap metal. And um, organics is both food waste and yard waste. And as you can see, that 24% is very significant. Um, although it's also worth knowing that that was before the law changed. So we're hoping that that number is already dropping as people are complying with the requirement to keep their food scraps out of the trash. And that 24% is particularly meaningful because it, the food scraps contribute disproportionately to the, the negative impacts of a landfill. And we'll get further into that. Um, but first we'll revisit the question of how much we generate and that's over four pounds a day. So going back to what, why we don't want food scraps in the landfill and those impacts, and that is your local landfill there. Um, there are two outputs of a landfill that have to be carefully managed because they have environmental consequences. So the landfill gas is largely methane, which means it's a very potent greenhouse gas. And the leachate is the, the runoff off the material um, that will wind up in a waterway eventually if, you know, the water table, um, if just allowed to seep into the ground. So in both cases, those are carefully collected and managed through significant infrastructure that you see here. And so this is sort of the difference between what we used to do with trash and throwing it in a hole in the ground um, and then just burning it and what a modern landfill looks like, which actually has quite a bit of infrastructure in it and uh, has to be built out at, at some cost. Um, so you see the liner to collect the leachate and that is pumped out, tankered, but trucked to the nearest wastewater treatment plant, which is not gonna be in Coventry. It's gonna be in a, a more urban um, setting like Newport or Montpelier is gonna be the closest to Coventry. <clears throat> um, and there are significant costs to treating that, uh, both getting it there and, and the, the treatment of it. And then there's also the, the gas being collected by having uh, plastic covering the material. So before it gets buried and it does get buried under soil, but it also has a plastic cover as well as a, a plastic underlayment. And so essentially, yeah, you don't let anything out. You don't let the leachate get out into the water table and you don't let the, the gas um, escape to contribute to climate change, but it does mean you're creating a plastic tomb um, in which not much will decompose. Really, when nothing is getting uh, in, not, like sunlight or air, um, there is not a lot of, um, and not much to facilitate decomposition. And so we point out that these carrots, um, which are still recognizable, they're discolored, but they are still recognizable as carrots, 
um, were 10 years old when they were excavated from a landfill. They had been there 10 years. And we know that because there was the newspaper buried next to them was still legible. So both the legibility of the newspaper and the carrots themselves suggest just how little decomposition is happening um, because we're intentionally sealing it up in there. So we contrast those um, negative, and I guess I should also point out that um, that the landfill gas is going to escape to some degree because not everything is immediately going to be covered over. So um, that even, even when you have a system for collecting and capturing that methane and are using it to power, you know, for elect electrical generation, as they do in Coventry, it, it actually does um, power homes, that methane, because they have a uh, huge um, methane power generators on site there. Um, but even when you have that system in place, there are plenty of opportunities for that gas to escape, like when you first throw the material into the cell before you've had a chance to fill it and cover it. So, um, in a compost pile, you have the benefit of particularly air to make it an aerobic uh, oxygen facilitated process. And so we contrast that purple carrot picture with this picture here of carrots that were not carefully uh, composted, but rather just thrown into a, a bin and checked on periodically, not a lot of maintenance. And this was actually was conducted by a colleague, this, this experiment, this was uh, my colleague Rhonda or Recycle Rhonda, the school outreach coordinator's experiment. So she used a mesh bag to contain the carrots and just pulled it out in you know about a couple week increments. And you see that you know even by four weeks they were less um, recognizable than they would be in the landfill. And of course, even on your front lawn, things will decompose much more quickly than they will um, in that landfill environment. So very quickly recapping. Composting and keeping the food scraps out of the landfill is reducing the greenhouse gas emissions, conserving resources. The food waste is a resource and that there's all those nutrients in it and preserving finite landfill space, which is often what people think of, but is only really one piece of um, the reason why we, it's worth doing. And we just quickly like to point out that just like we say the three R's for recycling, reduce, reuse, and then recycle. That's the third option, third best option. Um, composting is, is not where we should start. We should start with source reduction and then obviously food uh, recovery for, for feeding people is, is uh, far more ideal than composting, which is a, a lower, uh, lower value use. And then in terms of just sort of making sure we're all on the same page about what we're talking about when we talk about compost, sometimes because people often are referring to putting things in the compost, we, there's confusion about is the compost stuff that goes in the compost or is the compost stuff that comes out of the process? And it's the latter. Compost is the finished product, which as you may have guessed is pile B in this picture. So it's the rich um, soil amendment that, uh, that is good plant food. Um, a is food scraps, which go into the compost stream, but they're just a, an input into the composting process. Um, and you see there's a paper towel in there as well. And we'll talk about how that is also perfectly compostable in your backyard. And then pile C is plain old dirt. So largely inert material. Um, so think of like ground up rock rather than all the rich organics that are in compost. And as we covered, um, you know, when we use the term organics, we're talking about both the yard waste and the food waste. And basically it applies, it, it determines what's compostable, defines what's compostable largely, anything from plants or animals. And I did, did want to cover just the why compost is kind of special as a, you know, it's, it's like fertilizer, but it's different and it, um, is biologically alive. It's got a lot of living organisms in it. And that's the basis for a lot of its benefits. Um, those living organisms tend to outcompete pests and um, uh, problematic fungi. You know, you don't want uh, like blights and things. Um, and so natural disease and pest resistance because they're the good critters are likely to be competing with the bad ones. Um, it's improved soil structure. And it obviously has a lot of nutrients for plants um, in, in the ways that they need um, to access them. Um, but it also is a really good um, absorber of water. And so applying it to fields, not only 
gives plants more nutrition, but it also helps combat runoff issues. So one of the problems that we see locally is that uh, fertilizer gets washed immediately off the fields and into the nearest waterway where it creates algae blooms and, and other similar issues. And we have beach closures as a, re beach closures as a result. So um, compost by sequestering water better in fields and where it's applied um, is one way to, to combat those runoff issues. And as far as the mechanism that we are using to compost, we are really just harnessing nature, natural processes that are happening all around us. And those processes are facilitated by fungi, bacteria, and invertebrates. Um, we call those, whether we're talking about kids or adults, we call those the FBI agents because it's a really nice mnemonic device to remember them, FBI. Um, and we often think of the invertebrates as insects, but of course there's a much wider realm there. Like worms are not insects, um, but they are a big part of the composting process. And there are lots of similar invertebrates like these. Um, some of these are insects, some are not. And then um, as far as what we need to do to help these critters do their work, it's really just providing the things that all living organisms need to survive and thrive. And as you probably guessed, that is food, air, and water. So um, we'll talk more about each of these things, but we're looking for 60 to 65% um, moisture in your compost pile for it to be the right amount of moisture for composters, composting critters. Um, air, which is we're just putting in there by turning. And then the food recipe is a certain amount of greens and browns, and we'll get into that as well. And that's really as technical as it gets. Um, so if that seemed like we were getting, when we talked about talking recipes, that sounds complicated. Don't worry, it's not. How are we doing on our questions, Robin? Oh, you're muted. I just noticed that, thank you. Um, no questions coming in yet. Looks like uh, you're covering everything people were hoping to learn. Okay, great. And we do have a small group tonight, so don't be shy. We're happy to, um, questions are good. So um, jumping back in, what are um, the 60, 65% sounds like a very um, tricky thing to figure out. Like, okay, what's the, what's the tool I use to figure that out? Well, it's your hand actually. You just reach in and give the material a squeeze. And if you can wring water out of it, it's likely too wet. Like if you can squeeze it and it get drips to drip out. And if um, you squeeze it and it won't even clump, it sort of crumbles, then it's gonna be too dry. And if it clumps, but doesn't uh, release water, then it's just right, Goldilocks style. And then we mentioned that, that really air, I mean, the oxygen is all around us in the air. So all we need to do is make sure that the inner portions of the compost pile are getting that air. And um, that can be, there's some ways that you can create that air pockets with what you're putting in there. Um, like some people like to put like small uh, sticks in because they tend to create air pockets. We use um, wood chips in our commercial composting process at GMC for that to make the material more porous so that air penetrates it. Um, so you can you can do that a bit with bulking materials um, and, or uh, wood shavings are really good if you can get your hands on wood shavings. Um, but leaves do sets too. Leaves tend to have air pockets. Um, and then the main thing is just you can mix it or turn it frequently and we'll talk about ways to do that. Um, could even be, you know, stabbing it with a pitchfork to make sure that air can penetrate better. And this brings us to more about the food. Um, and obviously part of the food for our composting critters is the food scraps that we are trying to um, manage. The other part of their food is usually yard wastes. Um, and that's the, and we may call these greens and browns because food scraps tend to be nitrogen rich. And so we just, for simplicity's sake, refer to those as the green stuff, whether or not it's actually green in color. And yard wastes um, tend to be the woodier materials and those tend to be carbon rich. So um, people always wanna know what you can use for browns um, and leaves are the obvious one. Um, you can also use, as we said, wood shavings, but you can even use things like shredded cardboard or paper. They are wood products after all, and as long as they're not coated, those can be really good um, browns. 
Other thoughts about Browns, Robin? Um, I, I, I like leaves. Most people, you know, have them. Um, they, you know, they just fall gently into your yard. They're easy to rake up and just keep in a pile, right? I, you know, just keep a pile of them right next to my composter or, you know, put them in a garbage can that's right next to the composter. So every time you're adding food, you can just, you know, throw, throw a layer of leaves on top. Thanks. Yeah, leaves are usually what people are using, but um, not, you know, and if you can't get leaves, often you can get them from, if you can't, don't have them yourself, often you get them from a neighbor. But um, if not, there are many other ways to, to uh, provide your browns um, for your recipe. And what's, what's worth noting here, the, the main thing that often surprises people is that you need to be putting in, you're supposed to be putting in three times as much browns as greens. So in other words, if you're putting, you're dumping your bucket and it's mostly full of food scraps into your composter, sometime shortly thereafter, you should be adding three of the same buckets of leaves. Um, and that's that's the ratio. So you want more of the, the carbon rich materials um, to than, than of the nitrogen rich ones. Three to one. Go ahead. So I'm sorry to interrupt. I was trying to catch you at a pause. We, did, we do have a question. Um, that's come in sort of looking at the, the internal conflict between layering, you know, when you're, when you're adding stuff to the compost bin, you're doing greens and then layering it with browns like lasagna style. But then when you start turning it to get air in, obviously you're messing up those layers. And they're sort of wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you reconcile those, those two things and is one more important than the other? Yeah. That sort of it's thing. a good question, actually, and um, maybe that slide can be improved because uh, I would say that the turning is more important than the layering. I'll start there. Uh, the layering is really for when you're not going to be able to provide air in other ways. Um, so winter time, when your pile is frozen solid, is a good time to layer because then as it thaws out, it's not just one huge mass of food scraps, but your layers of leaves will... And then, and then obviously mixing is easier when you are able to mix. Um, but no, you should never, never um, avoid mixing just to preserve layering. Layering is really, you know, if you're going to be passive, if you're, if you're not really into the, um, the harder work of turning it like thoroughly over, you know, or flipping it and pile into a new bin, then at, at minimum layer. Um, because composting can be as sort of active or as passive a process as you want it to be. Um, you know, some people are really striving to have their compost pile sort of emulate what we do at GMC. It's not going to be possible to totally emulate that because um, a lot of what we do at our Green Mountain Compost Facility involves just the scale of the piles, like the sheer mass or volume of the piles is what allows us to reach the temperatures we do. But it is possible to do hot composting in the backyard, and um, but it's, it's not necessary. Like even if you're not reaching high temperatures, your food waste will continue to break down. It just might not be quite as quick. Um, so, so there, there are, and some people are going to be, you know, trying to expedite the process as much as possible. They're going to be turning it diligently, and some people are going to be more concerned about the fact that they're not having their food scraps smell on their countertop, and that's just going to prompt them to bring it out. And they're going to turn it when they get around to it, and that may not be very often, and that's okay. Um, that's the beauty of composting is that it really can be an active or as passive a process as you want. And if you just if you get lazy and your pile goes anaerobic, meaning you haven't turned in a while and the food scraps are all clumped together and start to be smelly um, because they're seeing no oxygen, which is what happens when it goes anaerobic. You, it does get smellier and slimier. Those are the things you'll see. Um, it's easily recoverable though. That's the thing. It's like, all you gotta do is add your browns then, once you see that, do more turning and you'll have it back to where you want it in no time. So that's one of the things is that it's really hard to mess up your compost pile as long as you're not putting in anything that's toxic or, you know, that's going to be a problem in terms of um, what it is, uh, you're like toxic, hazardous, et cetera, you're probably going to be fine and be able to easily save it. Um, so let's um, jump into more of the how to. Can we get it one other yeah. quick question on Brown? Someone asking if um, shredded paper can be used and I mean, that, that's an excellent thing. And we, we didn't cover some of those. So like newspaper, 
shredded, torn up or, or straight up or maybe wadded into balls can be great. Um, clean cardboard, you know, not, not with lots of tape or labels on it. Um, paper towels, things like that. Um, any, any kind of dry paper product is, is a great carbon source. And my only word of caution there is that it's always about what, not about the, like you have the paper product, you know, that's paper product, but what might it have with it? And so examples, as Rob mentioned, like packing tape on a box, obviously you don't want that in your house pile. That will not look good in your garden and won't compost. Um, but also be mindful what you use the paper towels for. Use them to, you know, napkins you've used to wipe your hands, mouth, great. Um, paper towel you've used to clean up in oil spill, uh, not so good, obviously. And that's an extreme example, but how about, um, better example would be household cleaners. You know, you, you sanitize your countertop, use a paper towel for that. That paper towel, the sanitizer on there is designed to kill microbes. It will, it will kill by design the very things that you're trying to um, assist in composting. So be mindful of those kind of things. And then as far as a little bit more about uh, paper and cardboard, we would advise any glossy colored um, paper cardboard it may be only a clay coating, which is not going to be a big problem in your compost pile, but harder to know. And there's more chance that it could be something exotic that you really don't want in there. Some sort of additive or exotic ink that is a problem. In general, inks are not problematic. They're usually soy based these days. And so we don't worry about what's the printing, but shiny colored would be a problem. Um, and the other thing about paper shredding is that if you are shredding your junk mail, be aware that that's not going to be just paper. There's going to be adhesives off the envelopes and those may be not good for plants. Um, and also the plastic windows and the, the inserts that might have, you know, glossy funky coatings. So um, I would be, if you're going to use uh, shredded paper, I would be making sure that it's like newspaper, office paper type stuff. Anything else, Robin? Nope. Looks good. Cool. So before I jump into sort of what to do in the backyard, this is before you get there, just sort of some best practices around collection. And if you already separate your food scraps, we may be not, this may not be um, anything too profound for you. Um, but there are a million different kinds of countertop containers out there. And one of the reasons why we don't offer any or sell any is because there are so many different sizes, styles, um, materials they're made out of. Some are stainless, some are plastic. Um, and there's also a lot of reuse opportunities. You know, if you don't want to buy a container, use your, your salad, your uh, lettuce clamshell or tub, um, you know, use your ice cream container, your coffee can, what have you. Um, key thing is that it be able to fit in your counter somewhere where it's going to be really easy to get to like next to your sink. Um, and you may want to line it. Um, some have, uh, it's, you know, the materials made up may, may, partially inform how easy it is to clean. One of the things I like about my stainless steel pail is that it's very easy to um, wipe out residues and, uh, and odors. Um, but if you're using something that retains odors more, you can use um, vinegar. You know, you can do a rinse with vinegar to get odors out. That's a trick there. Um, and so there are, there are plastic products and everything else. Some have uh, a charcoal filter built into the lid. And that's a nice feature. It's the idea is that it lets air in, but doesn't um, let the odors escape. It filters the odors out. I would say that as long as you're bringing your food scraps out fairly regularly, and I do because I don't want them to stick on my counter, I, um, you don't need to worry about whether there's air getting in. So a solid lid is also okay because if, if you're gonna be taking your food scraps out periodically, then they'll get their air soon, soon enough. Um, but if you're gonna go a week at a time, then maybe the charcoal filter is a, a nice benefit. Um, and I think that's about it for countertop containers. So. If you choose to line your container, you can do that with a compostable, certified compostable liner. So not it's not real plastic, it's a plant-based um, resin, but that may not break down well in your backyard. Um, that's where you really would wanna be hot composting. So for backyard composting, I would suggest better would be to line it with something like a paper bag um, or a newspaper. And they may absorb the moisture and stick a little bit, but for the most part, the food scraps will slide out on them and leave no residues behind which makes your life easier. And certainly at least once a week, um, they will start to smell on your counter um, once a week. And in the summer, you're gonna to wanna to take them out more often than that. 
Um, certainly we do hear about fruit flies and that is one consequence of leaving your food scraps on the counter for longer periods and they are kind of a, a hard to avoid nuisance. Um, you can you can sort of put uh, vinegar traps out and things. There are ways to mitigate them, but they do tend to like food scraps in the summer. There's no question. And so these are the steps that we will cover in more detail in just a second here, but starts with figuring out what you want to use for a system. And there, that actually is one of the, the more complicated parts of this process. Um, site again, figuring out where you're going to put it. Um, obviously, then you need to collect your stuff and, and then add it to the pile. And then it's going to need time while you're monitoring it, maybe doing some turning, but, but for the most part, you're a passive um, observer at that point while the uh, composting critters are doing their thing. You lost your connection a little bit there. Oh, okay. Thank you. You lost connection when I was at which step? Uh, just a moment ago. Um, okay. Thank you. So, yeah, so the, when it's cooking, it's largely a passive process. And so you're mostly going to be monitoring it, make sure that the it's not drying out. Um, and you're going to be turning it or, um, you know, giving it air periodically. But for the most part, you're going to be waiting on the composting critters to do their thing. And then it's, then it's time to harvest. So in terms of choosing a setup, um, there are, there are two different sort of categories and we haven't talked at all yet about backyard digesting. And we'll probably get into that in more detail later um, if people are interested, but that's really different in that you're not, you're not cultivating a finished compost product in the same way. Um, that digester is really made to make your food scraps go away and be convenient in that way, um, but it doesn't provide any benefits to your garden or isn't intended to. Um, and, and those products are more niche. Um, you know, most of the products that you'll come across will be backyard composters, but we do sell a product called a green cone, which is a backyard digester and you install it in the ground. And um, the idea is that your food scraps dry out in it. And then the, the moisture is basically flush into the soil and the what's left is relatively little. And that's um, breaks down to some degree and, and takes a very long time to, to build up in there because there's so little once the water is removed. Um, green cones are also um, a little bit more fussy in terms of um, we do hear people that find that they are not working as they had hoped. And so we'll talk a little bit more about what those um, considerations for a green cone are um, that go beyond what you need to think about for a, a backyard composter. Um, the backyard composters we sell are the soil savers um, which are just a basic, um, well, they are, well, you'll see next in a second here, but they're also tumblers that come in a variety of styles. And then some people really like three bin systems, which are sort of more, well, in some cases more basic, but they can also very easily um, a do it yourself option. And of course there's reuse opportunities as well. So you see the soil saver on the left here. Um, it's just basically a, a plastic box without a, without a bottom um, with lid that, that um, clamps secure, um, twist, twist the handles to uh, secure it down. And it does have the um, uh, hatches at the bottom for harvesting from the bottom, um, which we can talk more about when we talk about harvesting, but it's really very simple. It's got some air holes. The fact that it's black is a benefit because then it will, um, it may, uh, if it's in the sun, you get a little bit of solar heating to sort of help boost the, the heat in there. And then you see another similar kind of product in the upper right, that's not a soil saver, but also a, uh, like a, a stationary bin container. And then here you have uh, do-it-yourself options. So pallet-based system, a lot of people use pallets because it's they tend to be about the right size. You basically just attach them together and you have, you have your bins set up, your bays for your bins. And you can do two or three bays. And we'll talk more about how you use those bays. Um, the You see that a trash can has been converted into a um, composter. I've seen a laundry, like one of the vertical laundry hoppers, same idea that it has, already has holes in it. It will hold material. It can be converted into a, a composter. And then the lower left is an innovative idea using reusing a, a storm door um, as the lid so it gets more solar heating, which I thought was pretty clever. Um, and so that's just a way to boost again, the, boost the heat um, inside and expedite the process. 
In terms of tumblers, uh, as I said, many styles. Upper left is called a Yura, J-O-R-A. And what's special about that is that it has insulation in it. It's got uh, panels of insulation all around so that the idea is it extends the season and helps to retain the heat, um, especially during the colder months. Um, in my experience, it may extend the seasons a bit, but it still does not solve the problem of those, the really coldest winter months. You can see that tumblers come in spherical form. The ones in the upper right are, that's actually, that's on the store shelf. And so that's like a, a half, that's like the bottom half of like a clamshell style one. And then you see the other, the other style. So sometimes you actually have to turn the whole container. Sometimes you can just turn a crank kind of thing. Um, often they get easier and uh, bigger as you're willing to spend more money. Um, and then before we um, jump into the demo videos, I just wanted to point out that um, by separating food, you are you're getting you're getting information about what you're wasting. And all, we often hear from people who have just started composting for the first time about how eye-opening it is about how much food they waste. And it's true that you don't really see it until you're separating it. And, and then you start to see the patterns and realize that some things just get wasted a lot. Um, so use that feedback and figure out, you know, have it inform your, your, your behaviors and what you buy. Um, another point I like to make is that backyard composting has limitations and especially in the winter, um, and so consider, you know, using drop-off composting as a supplement to backyard composting. You are, you are allowed to throw your meat and bones in the trash if you are backyard composting as your way of keeping all other food scraps out of the trash. So meat and bones aren't, are advi you're advised not to put them in a backyard compost setup because they are more likely to attract animals and um, create odors. Um, so for those reasons, this, the state created an exemption in the law and said, if you're gonna do everything else, you can put your food, your meat and bones in the trash, but you can also um, commercially compost them through agreement on compost. So if you bring them to one of our drop-off centers, um, that's, that's one way that you can have everything, including the meat and bones and grease. And some people are concerned about dairy, any of that stuff can go in the, the drop-off compost. Um, that we take at our drop-off centers for composting for GMC. So consider like doing a little of both or just doing backyard in the summer when it's easy and when it gets hard, maybe you switch to bringing most of your compost in. Um, if you have particularly stubborn items too, like um, I've given up on trying to compost avocado pits, um, but even the skins are pretty stubborn and, and corn cobs and things like that. So if you just don't feel like waiting for them in your backyard because they're going to be slower than everything else, send them to us. We'll take care of them. And then you can also do some experimentation and there are um, good materials available from um, local businesses and things. Coffee shops, it's a waste product for them. They're having to pay to have somebody pick it up for composting. Um, so come bring them a five gallon bucket and ask whether you can help yourself to their spent coffee grounds. It's a great additive. Um, there are opportunities to get wood shavings too. You just wanna make real sure that they're raw wood and not anything that's been painted, finished or pressure treated. Any other questions, Robin? Nope. Um, I just wanted to add one thing about the more stubborn items. Um, another one option, which wouldn't work so well with, with avocado pits, but for things like corn cobs, which tend to, or eggshells, which tend to break down more slowly, is uh, the smaller pieces they're in, the faster they're going to break down. So you, you can, you know, crush the eggshells in your hand or chop up the corn cobs into smaller pieces that'll help speed things along because there's more surface area for the FBI agents to work on. Great, thank you. And I'll use the opportunity too to talk about some of the, the concerns we often hear um, about adding certain things. So um, I mentioned meat and bones, that is a real concern. That is something that you will, the general guidance is no meat and bones in the back of compost for the reasons I mentioned. I will also say, however, that that is, um, general guidance and really applies to in quantity. I don't worry about like a little bit of lasagna left on my plate, meat lasagna, scraping that into my compost. Like the amount of meat compared to the amount of other stuff, not a big deal. And in general, that's true of any, you know, even if it's just meat, um, if it's a small amount of cooked meat, I'm not going to worry about putting it into my compost if I'm burying it. But that's also important is that I don't leave it right on the top for animals to smell and I make sure it's well buried. 
Um, Bones and bones, um, I choose to compost as well, uh, usually, um, at least until for the first round, then I usually they get screened out. And so then they do um, sometimes go to um, for drop off composting or something like that, because they're not going to break down in, in a back compost. We're just not going to achieve the temperatures to break down something that's that stubborn. Um, so uh, meat and bones are one. Uh, as I mentioned, dairy is sometimes people are concerned about dairy. Again, I don't worry about small quantities. Um, if I had a, a huge tub of yogurt, I would might um, reconsider whether that should go in my backyard. In my case, to be honest, I would probably just create a nice deep pocket in the middle of my pile and bury it deep. Um, and then citrus is sometimes mentioned. And I have to say that as far as I know, the um, concerns around citrus are not, not uh, justified. Um, I compost a lot of citrus in my backyard and never had a problem. Yes, citrus uh, fruits can be acidic, but in general, you don't need to worry too much about the pH. You know, you'd have to have, you have to be doing a, a major, uh, you know, orange juice pressing operation for the amount of citrus compared to other stuff to really make a difference in the pH. And that's in general, our guidance around things that are strongly acidic or alkaline is as long as you're not, you know, putting huge quantities of them, you're not gonna need to, to worry about the pH. And some, in most cases, their pH isn't so extreme that you have to worry about it anyway. Um, it is one of the reasons why we don't suggest putting um, wood ashes in your compost because they are highly alkaline um, and so they can throw off the pH. You'd also want to be careful about using large quantities of pine needles. Um, but again, I would say that's if you're using pine needles exclusively as your substitute for leaves. I don't think you need to worry if like, you know, occasionally you're throwing in a few handfuls of pine, uh, pine needles. Um, about, that's not going to throw off your pH such that you need to monitor, I don't think. Are there other, uh, we've, Brad? We've had an interesting question in, I've never gotten before. I know I know what my answer would be, like I know what I would do, but um, I don't know if there's more um, guidance out there, but uh, what about sourdough discard? I mean, personally, I would check it in my compost. I would too. Yeah, but I've, I've never heard anyone raise concerns about it. And I would think it's got, you know, some yummy yeast and things in there that's gonna help probably boost the composting process to some degree. Yeah, I, I uh, it's got the stuff in it, kind of stuff in it that's what you want in your compost pile, right? Living living organisms. Um, so no, I wouldn't say that a problem. We sometimes hear concerns expressed about bread. I mean, people have heard somewhere that the bread's a problem and no, it's not. Um, it's worth noting, I guess, that that you're not going to want to eat your your compost pile. Um, but more seriously, um, there are potential some of the fungi that can occur in a compost pile are neurotoxins, and so you will not want your neighbor's dog going to town in your compost. And so that's one of several reasons why you probably want to have your pile secured to some degree. You don't want to just have a wide open pile. Um, but um, so we do. That is a word of caution that that um, compost can be pretty seriously toxic to dogs. Um, but that's obviously a special case. And um, if you are securing your pile, um, then you're fine. Ready to jump into videos? All right, videos it is. So if you've decided that you wanna pursue backyard composting and that's not your only option, there are other ways you can do it like drop off composting. But if you're interested in pursuing backyard composting, then you have some decisions to make about how you want to do it. There are six steps to that process of backyard composting, starting with choosing your system, choosing a site or siting your, your container, uh, the materials you add to it, picking the right materials, building your pile, letting it cook down or compost, and then harvesting from it, using it in the garden. Um, so starting with what container or system you want to use. You have a few basic categories as options. One example is our soil saver over there. This is a very basic system. It is just a plastic box. It does not have even a floor in it, in fact, but you can either put it on um, something like a piece of plywood or you can just let it rest right on the ground. It is um, easy to open but does lock down so one of its features is that it secures 
from pests, um, and it is very affordable. On the downside, you will need to turn the material by hand, so it's a little bit more labor intensive, um, but durable, simple, functional. If you're interested in getting a little bit more creative, um, you can build your own composting system. And what we would recommend is a two or three bin system. And what you see here is an example of a three bin system made from pallets. You can also make these from virtually anything, including cinder blocks or hardware cloth, chicken wire type stuff and stakes. Um, these are obviously harder to secure, but it certainly can be done as you see here on the bit bay that we add to. Um, but often the benefit of these is that you have, you are, it's a rotational system, so that you're adding to one bay and you're flipping it into the next bay when it's ready. The, uh, the next option you would have would be some sort of a tumbler system. And a tumbler system is different than a soil saver in that it is not directly on the ground. So critters from the ground can't get directly into it, but you do not need to uh, turn it by hand. You just need to crank it and it does the work of adding the air and um, giving the critters what they need in terms of mixing the material. Finally, you have a system like uh, what we have up here called a green cone, and that is a digester, not a composter. And there are some fundamental differences we'll get into more, but it impacts the kind of materials you can use in it, and it has a lot of implications for siting. So we'll talk about the mostly limitations around uh, under what circumstances in terms of available siting you can use a green cone. And in fact, we might as well jump into that now since siting is topic number two in planning your um, backyard composting. So, um, what you need for a green cone is well-draining soil. So it really needs to be sandy um, or gravelly, and you can create that yourself if you're willing to do the extra work. Um, otherwise, you just need to have that in the area that you choose to dig your hole for it. It also really needs direct sunlight. It needs to be aided with the heat provided by being in the sun. And so if you can only, if you only can find a shady spot, that is not gonna be a good fit for you. And we'd recommend a composter instead. Um, as far as citing a composter, um, you are wanna, gonna wanna think about how to secure it. You're gonna wanna think about proximity and convenience. Um, the closer to have, be more convenient for you, especially in the winter, if you're gonna have to shovel your way out there. Um, but also keep in mind that there will be some extra fly activity around it, so you're not going to want it right up against your house. Um, it also can attract some critters, although if you do it well, that's less of a concern, particularly if you make it inaccessible, like as a soil saver does with the clamp down lids. Uh, always good if you can get, get it some extra solar by putting it in the sun as well. One more oft overlooked consideration when it comes to siting your compost container or even your digester, your green cone, is tree roots. There really is a concentration of nutrients that will be coming, emanating from your, your composter. And unless your composter is off the ground or you have set on something, tree roots will have access to those nutrients and they will seek them out. They will actually grow into, from the ground, your composter and add root mass, especially if you're not turning it regularly. So we would suggest not setting your compost bins exactly where you see these next to the woods. Avoid trees and shrubs when siting. Okay, do we have any questions coming in, Robin? Nope, so far so good. Okay, I'll uh, take this opportunity to mention what I didn't get into earlier about, because we talked about, we're talking about you know, supplementing the heat. And what I failed to mention is that the if you create these optimal conditions for especially the fungi and bacteria, um, they will create the heat themselves. They basically, as they become more energetic and active, they they produce heat. Um, so that's the 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 browns that are carbon rich are like carbohydrates for them. That's the energy that they need. And then the greens provide the proteins. So for replication, um, so that they can make more and more of them. And, and then with the right mix, they get more active. They generate heat, that heat breaks down material quicker. It also makes the conditions more hotter. 
so that more thermophilic heat loving um, microbes survive and thrive. Um, so that's, that's really the, the idea behind hot composting, which as I said, you don't have to achieve in order for your material to be breaking down and for you to be a successful composter. But um, that's, what, that's what expedites our, process, our commercial process. And it is kind of um, the ideal that, that many people are trying to achieve in their backyards. And it can be, uh, it can be a little fickle um, in my experience. And I say this as someone who's a little bit bitter because my soil saver that I've been monitoring carefully this spring was still frozen solid when my colleague Rhonda showed us our demo bin, the one that you were just looking at that she'd been monitoring that was already warm and, and cooking um, this spring. And maybe mine was a little bit more in the shade, but that doesn't seem to explain it all. So, um, so I don't pretend to always know what the answer is to get your compost bin to heat up. Um, but I can say that it's very, it's very hard to keep your compost going through the winter. You really need a giant pile to do that. That's really the only way that you're going to, so that it has enough mass to have insulation on the outside while the core can, can get hot. Um, you can, if you're using a tumbler or something where it really doesn't have a lot of access to the soil, you might throw in a handful of um, healthy soil to introduce some of those microbes that are naturally occurring to sort of jumpstart the process. Um, one of the ways that we jumpstart a process at Green Mountain Compost is that we inoculate with the runoff from previous composting um, loads, uh, batches, I should say. So, so that, that runoff water, um, which we have to keep separate because it hasn't been through the process, but it's full of the uh, active microbes. And so they, that's like introducing them immediately to their food so they can go to town. Um, other... And then I think the, the, main, the main considerations in terms of trying to uh, get your temperature up is, you know, you don't want to disrupt the, the heat too much. So there is this thing that's like, it's pretty good with a tumbler overturning so that you can't sort of, the heat can't build up. Um, and then you really want to make sure that you have the, a good mix of material. And this is where probably having the smaller chunks may be helpful too. Like if, you know, all you have is for food scraps are things like um, carrot tops and uh, grapefruit halves. That's not the kind of stuff that's likely to generate heat very quickly. You're going to want some, some finer stuff um, that's, so you could, um, things like spent grains are really good, good for that. Um, something like you want some, some fine, uh, food scraps that will create a very uh, sort of intense core. Um, we'll, we'll move on to materials for your building your pile. So now I'm going to demonstrate how we use our three bin system, our homemade system. Um, the third bay, as we call it, um, is for our leaf storage. So that's where we store our leaves. So basically we're working with these two bays. We've cleared this one out, sieved out all of the compost, and now what we're gonna do is this one's been sitting for a while, we've been filling this one up. Honestly, I mean, you would probably want to, or you want to fill it all the way to the top. Um, it's just for demonstration reasons, we're gonna flip it halfway through. So we've got about a half a bay full. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna flip it over into the second bay, let that cook for another year and then next spring check on it see where it's in the composting process hopefully we'll sift out um sift out some of the compost whatever the chunkies are left over we'll put back into the system and we'll just use um we'll use bay one as our new um our new uh compost pile to start building once again That pile will sit there for the next uh, till next spring, just kind of hanging out. I will uh, check on it every so often, give it a little water and dry times. Right now, you saw with that squeeze test, it's uh, looking pretty good. Um, 
So uh, right now it's looking fine, but I will check on that uh, probably weekly or every other week um, until, you know, winter hits. Um, adding water where needed and giving it a fluffle duffle do ya every once in a while to circulate and kind of mix everything together. But that is uh, flipping the pile. And now this bay is ready to start all over again with that layering of food scraps and leaves or whatever you're using for brown food. Ta-da! All right, so you've got the kind of compost system you want or digester. Um, we've got our site selection. So the next thing to choose is, uh, or the next thing to address, I should say, is what kind of stuff can you compost? Well, anything that comes from a plant and or an animal technically can be composted. Mother Nature is composting all the time. Uh, and that compost, the finished compost, is what's going to feed your garden or your lawn or the trees in the woods behind me, right? Um, compost is a uh, humus is the technical term um, for compost, right? That's what Mother Nature uh, creates. Uh, and we, because we're impatient, uh, like to uh, speed things up. And because typically we tend to be a bit wasteful, we have a lot more things to compost than say Mother Nature does. All right, so what kind of things? Food scraps, all right? And we're talking backyard system right now. Um, and so in your backyard system, when you're composting, we don't, uh, we recommend that you don't compost meat, bones, and dairy, right? And that's not because they won't compost down. Um, it's just because, uh, Critters tend to, critters being like raccoons and skunks and even the crows, uh, tend to hone in on those smells um, and visuals. So uh, you don't definitely, uh, you, you don't really want them in it. I mean, if you don't mind, go ahead. I'll be honest, I have always composted all of my food scraps when I've composted outside. So um, except for raw meats and fish, I don't do that. But uh, anything cooked, I just throw in there. So that's your choice all right when you're in the house you can collect your food scraps with just about anything now yes can you get a fancy composter like or, the, or a food scrap collector like this one sure you can and it comes with this cool little uh charcoal filter that kind of keeps the smell down all right i've had this for probably about 20 years so uh this one's gonna stay with me all right because I'm going to keep using it. But if you're new to the game of food scrap collection, you can use anything out there. And as a matter of fact, we recommend that you do reuse whatever you have in the house, all right? Because as you know, reducing and reusing is, uh, is a more important step than even recycling, including recycling your food scraps. So here we've got an old uh, ice cream tub. We've got coffee uh, container. Even those little lettuces that you buy in the plastic containers can be used. And all of this fits very nicely right in the fridge. So you can keep those smells down as you're collecting food scraps, all right? Or this giant coffee thing. So again, you can collect in anything. If you want to collect at home and, um, or collect in your kitchen and then um, take it to a larger bucket outside, which is what I do in my house, then uh, you can collect in you know, in anything. So here I've got an old Home Depot bucket that I had sitting around, and that's what I store all of my food scraps in until I am ready to compost them. All right, in a big, big batch. So, food scraps. So without food scraps, and as we learned earlier, um, those microbial friends, our, our bacteria and the fungi, and even the invertebrates, especially outside, so those FBI agents, really enjoy a certain recipe all right so we're going to keep in mind three parts brown food like leaves straw wood chips sawdust shredded paper all of those little newspaper things you get in the mail shred those up and throw them in the compost pile why not right um so all of those brown foods you want three times as much brown food as you do your green food all right green food being all of your food scraps, all right? High in nitrogen gives them the proteins they need to replicate. The brown foods, and today we're gonna to be uh, demonstrating with leaves, all right? Uh, brown food gives those microbes the energy they need to get the job done, all right? So, 
Now we've got our, uh, our what we would call feedstocks, that's the technical term, but all of the stuff you need to build a healthy, successful, and delicious pile of food scrap, I mean of compost. All right, so we're gonna use our backyard three bin system here. Um, and we had already turned over our working bay, all right, our working, uh, working side. This is the side that's gonna be cooking down. We'll talk about that in a minute. So how do we build this pile? All right, again, keeping in mind that three to one ratio, very important. Also keeping in mind 60 to 65% moisture is really critical and probably one of the top mistakes I see in backyard composting um, is that people don't think that they need to water it. Well, like you, those microbes, they need water to survive. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna, so this is, we we're working on building it. It's kind of like layering a lasagna, if you will. You'll hear the lasagna method a lot. All right, so um, I'm gonna actually just kind of dig a little uh, ditch in the middle here, all right? Um, like such, with my handy dandy pitchfork, all right? This is Ethan's favorite composting tool, the pitchfork. All right, I've got my bucket of food scraps here. All right, it's about three-fourths full. And I'm just gonna dump all of that right in the middle, right like that. All right, then I'm gonna take my bucket and I'm gonna stuff it with leaves. How many more, how many buckets of leaves do I need? Three, because I have about a bucket full of Here's three. Uh -uh. All right, easy as that. Right like that. I'm gonna spread it out a little bit. I'm actually gonna use um, some leaves to throw around the sides too. I like to kind of insulate it um, from smells and attracting critters. Um, and critters being, again, the skunks, the raccoons, all of that stuff. So, I'm just gonna use what's left in here kind of insulate around the outside. Now, I tend to be a bit of a lazy composter sometimes, so I like to throw a few sticks and twigs in there. It uh, it creates air pockets for these guys to breathe. All right, so I'm just gonna shushle that around the outside a little bit. Give it a little insulation. All right, so now the last thing to do, probably got like a little food scrap stuck in your bucket here. Maybe you have running water out there. We do not here. So, you got a bucket of water here. I'm just gonna give this bucket a nice little rinse dinsel do ya. And I'm gonna pour that right over the top of my pile. Right like that. And this pile's pretty dry. So, I think what I'm gonna do is go ahead and add a bunch of more water. Even though it did just rain. And it's gonna rain later on this week. But because this is nice and open, it will dry out pretty quickly. And it's really windy here, so it'll dry out. You wanna keep a check on that, all right? So, we're ready to let that cook, all right? Until at least the next time. So we'll continue to build this pile up. The bigger the pile, the hotter it's gonna get in the middle. And as you will see from Amy McVeigh, she can get her piles up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, so that this middle pile we turned over, and this is cooking, cooking away in here. So this is gonna cure or cook away for maybe probably another year. So if you're looking for compost in like a year, less than a year in your backyard, it may happen. It may happen, I'm not saying it's not gonna happen, but it's probably not that likely, especially in an open system. And these are pretty large bays. Typically you want three by three by three, all right, and fill it all the way up and then let it cook down. Um, that will get the heat going and that'll give that perfect environment for the microbes to start partying and go ahead and uh, kick up that heat a little bit. So this is cooking and I wanted to show you guys the moisture level. So we talked earlier about the squeeze test. I, my uh, my uh, motto is always dirty hands are happy hands, so dig on in there. So, if you dig on into this compost pile, and yes, it did just rain. Woo, look at that Mac Daddy. So there is one of those FBI agents, the fantastical 
earthworm, all right, night crawlers. These are not composting worms, all right, don't confuse them, but they do like the compost pile because they're eating a lot of that broken down um, soil in there. So Ethan, can you show us uh, what a uh, perfect moisture, or good moisture uh, content in our compost pile looks like? Sure, we're gonna hope that this, um, this compartment here has stuff that's a good example. So digging down beyond the leaf layer, there are more leaves on top to get a good mixture. We are gonna give it the squeeze test. So I'm gonna, if I can wring water out of it, it is too moist. If it retains its shape, it is just right. Let's give it a shot. Cannot wring any water out of it, but I certainly can make a nice compost ball. Excellent, thank you. So the Soil Saver, much like the uh, homemade uh, three bin system that we just learned about, pretty much, I mean, you're gonna do the same thing. Only thing is this thing is nice and locked down, so you just wanna twist the locks off, all right? Looks very similar on the inside. Um, and it's a little dry, all right, because the Soil Saver um, it does not come with these holes drilled, all right? I drilled those because we thought like it would help put rain in there. Um, but you can always just like, if on a rainy day, just leave the lid cockeyed like that and let the natural rain come in. So um, you're gonna build the pile up just like you did with the uh, three bin system. So I'm gonna get in here. I'm gonna just make a little hole, all right? Kinda just helps a little. Ooh, it's chilly in there. So this is my compost from home. And I'm just gonna, it's not very much. I'm just gonna put it in there. Now you'll notice too that I included some paper. I line my compost uh, bin at home with paper. So um, it's not as, uh, as a hot mess to clean out at the end of the day. Um, I also have some parchment paper in there, but I'm just gonna put that in there. I can cover this back up, all right? And because I added a little bit of leaves, I mean a little bit of food scraps, gonna come over here and kind of guesstimate this is about three of those or at least two of those and just kind of spread that over now to rinse my container out maybe you have water access <laughs> I do not but um, so I'm just gonna give this a little rinsel dinsel do ya like that all right right like that and I'm just gonna pour it right in here and that'll give it a little moisture because remember you want it to be like squeeze so if you check this out like if you dig down a little further and I get in here and I squeeze my compost falls right apart all right squeeze falls right apart that's not what you mean that is way too uh, not enough moisture all right what you would rather is maybe if we dig down deeper it's nicer down in the bottom we'll see so what you want is yeah, even that's too dry. The whole pile is too dry. So all we need to do is add a bunch more water. So thankfully, I brought a bunch with me. And so that's how I would be fixing this pile. Probably even a little bit more. I'd probably just be dumping some in there like that. Because if it gets too wet, you can always add more leaves just kind of uh, to uh, level it out. All right, so we're ready to go. Boom, done lid back on, snap it back down, nice and secure. There, you've just created your soil safer compost. Okay, so um, Rhonda was right that I really do like the pitchfork. I, I was not a pitchfork user um, for composting before I joined CSWD and it has been a bit of a, an insight because it's much easier to have material stay on the pitchfork than it is a shovel. It's easier to get it into the pile. It stays on, so it's easier to, to actually efficiently move it. But it also, going back to that uh, question of overturning and, and retaining heat, stabbing your pile is a way to sort of leave the core intact so that you're more likely to retain heat, especially when temperatures are colder, um, while still being able to introduce air with the pitchfork stabbing method. So. I'll mention that. Um, I was also reminded that there are benefits to having a couple of containers, um, which as you saw with the, the three bin system, that it's much easier 
to just flip the material into a, into a new bin or into a second container than it is to try to mix it thoroughly in place. Um, one thing that people do that if they only have one soil saver um, is you can just uh, pick the soil saver up, like remove it off your pile, plunk it down next to your pile, and then flip the material that's now, you know, not in anything back into the soil saver in its new location. Um, that's one way to, to turn it thoroughly. Um, as you saw, the three bay system can be used for all three can be composting at different stages. So one's what you're adding to and the other two are, you know, mid stage and finish stage. Or you may want to use just one bay as your brown storage where you put your pile of leaves and, and keep that dry and covered. You got other things to add, Robin? No, I think we're in good shape. All right, then we'll keep moving. So now that you've let your pile cook down, and again, it might take like a year or so, maybe two years, depending on how uh, hands-on you are or how happy your microbes are. So now it is time to harvest. So we actually sieve out our, um, our compost so that we can throw the chunky monkeys back in to continue composting or the leaves that are covering up the pile. Now this pile hasn't been cooking very long, so we're probably gonna have a lot of chunky monkeys in there and definitely a lot of leaves. So don't base it upon this. This is just kind of a new pile. So I think this is started in probably like October of last year. So obviously not composting much over the winter. So we have made a, uh, a, a sieve out of old uh, two by fours and some um, hardware cloth. You can do it however you want. This is the time to engineer guys, all right? Get on those engineer hats. So, we're just going to take, we're going to dig down in here, and we're just going to throw it on here. Now, it did just rain, so this is like really wet stuff too, but and as Ethan said, <clears throat> sighting it along a tree line is not the wisest thing, um, and that's just because I just dug into a bunch of roots as well because they're just coming up and eating it. So you can just move this all over the place like this. The bits of finished compost will fall into your wheelbarrow or I use a tarp actually at my own house because um, I actually compost with worms so it's a little different. And all right. And typically you wouldn't do this when it's like saturated and wet like this, but sometimes you just got to take opportunity where opportunity lies with the weather these days. All right, so like I said, this isn't cooking down all that long, but we're going to... So, we didn't get much out of there. But we did get, that is the finished compost right there. All right, and I can see some things moving around in there. Oh, there's a little spider. So don't be afraid, it's all fine. They're all compost critters, all right? They're all our friends. All right, so this stuff is ready to go on your garden and feed those bean plants, feed those uh, spinach plants, or even your flowers. Now, harvesting from the uh, soil saver is very similar, except you got a little door right here. And again, I don't really know what to expect in here. So you've got a little door and you can just kind of shovel it out from underneath. Oh, look at that. All right. Ha. That actually looks pretty darn good. So there's some eggshells in there. Is that going to hurt your garden? Absolutely not. They will break down eventually. All right. So don't worry if there are little pieces of food still left in there un, um, uncomposted. You can just turn that right into your soil. It's really not that big of a deal. So that is Harvesting 101. So sometimes um, people notice that, that if you're harvesting from the uh, hatch at the bottom of a soil saver, um, that and you're mixing it, that you're not guaranteed to have older material than, than anywhere else because you're mixing it, and that is true. 
I don't find that it works super well to um, try to pull, to keep composting on the top and pull from the bottom as it's finished. I prefer to do them in batches and mix it thoroughly and then just, and which means it's not efficient to harvest through the hatch at the bottom. It's easier just to uh, pull it, all of it out of the top or take the, even better, take the soil saver and move it, you know, aside and just shovel it the pile from there. Um, I, recent feedback from one of these workshops was um, someone was disheartened about the amount of finished compost they saw sifted out there. And um, it's true that that wasn't much. What you were seeing there was compost that was, there wasn't a lot of finished compost there to sift. And so it was a lot of leaves um, and we just had what we had for the demo. So it is true that things will break down at very different rates. And so unless you're comfortable with big chunks in your garden, you'll probably want to do the sifting that you saw there, but you can do that, you know, as early or late as you want, you know, you can wait till almost everything except the most stubborn stuff has broken down. And most of what you're sifting is going to wind up as your finished compost, um, sifted finished compost, or what you saw was, um, as if we were trying to do it more aggressively and we're in a real hurry to do it as early as possible, in which case a lot of stuff that was there was not broken down. A lot of it was still leaves and so forth, and we didn't get much. But so I just point out that that, that was partially a function of the fact that it was demo and that we wouldn't have normally harvested at that time. It was the reason why we got so little. Any questions, Robin? Nope. Wow. We got a quiet group tonight. Okay. Um, well, that was our last video about backyard composting. Um, what we have left is a green cone video, and I'm happy to make that optional. Um, so what I'll do right now is just mention, again, the distinctions between a green cone and a composter. Um, a green cone it takes a little bit more to install and certainly needs to be in well-draining soil and in, in direct sunlight, or at least for most of the day. Um, it you cannot harvest any compost out of it. And it only takes food scraps. It is not for yard waste. So for some people that's great. It means you don't have to worry about creating a recipe. You don't have to worry about finding leaves, none of it. Um, but if you're hoping to get rid of your, some of your yard waste, like your leaves um, by composting, obviously that's not gonna be as good a solution for you. Um, it obviously is not the kind of thing where you can put then carbon rich materials like, like any paper in it either. So. You're not going to want to put your paper towels or anything like that in there. It's just for your food scraps. Uh, what am I missing about green cones, Robin? Uh, the other thing is it's for all food scraps, including meat and bones. Mm. So it's a, whereas backyard composting is a solution for most of your food scraps. Um, you know, there are a few things that you don't want to put in there. So you would need to either still throw them away, which is permissible under the law. If, you're, if your food scrap management plan is to backyard compost, then you are still allowed to put meat and bones into your trash, um, or you can bring those to a drop-off center, but you, know, you need a separate plan for the, for the meat and bones. And with the, with the digester, you don't, just all the food scraps go in. So it's um, you know, just, just sort of a, a different, it accomplishes different goals. So it will help you get rid of all your food scraps, but it won't produce compost for your garden and it won't get rid of leaves and yard waste. So if you know you have a small yard and you don't garden, it might be a good solution for you if it's, you know, if you have a good site for it. Um, but if you're interested in getting lots of rich compost to feed your garden and you have a lot of trees dropping leaves around, um, then you're going to need a different plan for managing all that stuff. Good point. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I'll, I'll mention that the, the bones are not going to attract critters in a green cone is the idea, but they're not also going to um, desiccate and disappear in there because they're bones. So they, to the extent that you're putting bones in a green cone, they will wind up building up over time. And part of the reason why you can do meat and bones in a green cone is because it is a, it is sealed much more than you don't need air to get in there in the same way that you do for a backyard composter where it's really important to the process. Um, and so it's a solid cover on top and the food scraps are actually below ground level. And so you can stand over one of a green cone in my experience and, uh, and really not smell much at all, even when you're standing mm -hmm. right over it. That's also true of a backyard compost setup, but only if you're managing it well, you know, it should smell only earthy really. If you've got, if you're adding enough 
um, Browns, that's really the number one way to keep down the odors is to make sure you're adhering to the ratios, but also, you know, making sure it's not too moist, for instance. Um, did I see a question come in? Uh, that was just a thanks very much. Okay. Um, please chime in in the Q&A if you would like to see the green cone. It's, um, it's a video on um, installing the green cone and, and how that works. Um, the other thing I can say about the green cone is it does enrich this. It is likely to enrich the soil around it. Um, just and in that way attract roots and things. But um, so if you can find the perfect site that has the sunlight and the well-draining soil and is near your flower garden, um, then your flower garden will probably benefit from having it um, there. I've, I've actually heard of people installing them right in the center of their garden, like in because that's a place where they get a lot of sun and uh, and then the nutrients just, you know, they, they just get absorbed into the soil that surrounds the, the green cone. So I've heard, I've, I haven't used one myself for any length of time, but, but I've been told that you can kind of see the circle around, around the green cone. You can kind of tell how far those nutrients have, have spread by more vigorous growth. It's like, you know, the grass is always greener, you know, in your leach fields kind of thing. Mm. Okay, so if I, um, we're not getting any um, requests for the video, so I'm gonna assume that means people are, are thinking backyard composter rather than, than green cone digester, and that's fine. Um, we will be sending out uh, a follow-up email that will include uh, links to uh, resources, including the videos. And so if you do wanna check out the green cone video, uh, you can do that um, by following the link. And without, if we don't have further questions, um, I'll let everyone enjoy their evenings, but we appreciate you joining us, especially on this um, beautiful, beautiful evening. And we are here to answer questions as they come up. Um, so, you know, th this doesn't need to be the, the last time um, you uh, tune in or, or get uh, questions answered. Um, we have a hotline. Uh, we're available by email and we're happy to answer questions about backyard composting. Um, in some cases, we can be helpful and in others, uh, we're, <laughs> we're figuring out as you are. Um, and that was kind of my part of my answer to a question about hot composting is that uh, I mm -hmm. wish I could get my compost reliably hot and knew what the secret was. Um, I'm still figuring it out myself, but I enjoy the experimentation and there's a lot of opportunity to sort of figure it out on the fly without any real consequences of, of experimenting. Um, so, and going back to the hybrid idea, I will just mention that Ra um, Rhonda referred to worm composting. I'll put in a plug for that. That is a good winter time another good wintertime option that can be done inside. Um, they don't, the worms don't wind up all throughout your house um, and is a good way to manage food scraps at a time when they're pretty hard to manage in your backyard. So um, that can be a hybrid system is worm composting with backyard composting. Okay, everyone, thank you very much. Thanks Robin for playing wing and uh, reach out anytime. Thanks for joining us. Thanks all.